The next segment will take us up to the world stage. This map is one of my favorites from the collection, Urbano Monti. Yes, Italian, you guessed it. Uh, widely recognized as the first complete, relatively modern map, but it is not a Mercator projection. It's a different projection, but generally accurate, except for the really big lobster in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I, I don't know that we've actually discovered the really big lobster yet. But with this, I have the privilege of introducing Sam Podolicchio. Sam is in the global diplomacy space as an academic and teacher around the world. And I'll leave it to Sam to introduce our three very esteemed panelists. This is truly a privilege for all of us to have Wendy, Evo, and Clyde with us today. Sam. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. You could all sit on the couch and be no evil. Okay. <laughs> so we have a uh, dream team assembled today that covers, I think, three different categories that we should talk about when it's vision on the global stage. Ambassador Wendy Sherman, a lead negotiator in the 90s in North Korea and recently with Iran. Ambassador Dalder, the permanent representative to NATO, now running the Council on Global Affairs here in Chicago. Clyde Tuggle, the longtime chief communication officer and senior vice president at Coca-Cola, who's been responsible for opening up businesses for Coca-Cola in Central Europe and Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, Clyde does consumers, Ambassador Dalder does allies, and Ambassador Sherman does adversaries. <laughs> Such fun. <laughs> Congratulations. So my first question, given the state of play in the world today, is to Ambassador Sherman. Uh, how can we develop and cultivate a vision to deal with adversaries? And what do you see going forward in how we handle countries that might be adversarial to the United States? Well, first of all, it's great to be here uh, at this conference and with my colleagues, whom I know quite well and have done many wonderful things over the years to try to deal with consumers, allies, and adversaries. Um, so it's great to be here. Uh, look, we're in a really tough place. Uh, I believe in engagement with people. Uh, I believe, as Churchill famously said, jaw, jaw is better than war, war. Uh, it's always better to talk. Uh, but when you talk with an adversary, you have to come with a strategy, a plan, a team that can follow up, uh, know, have done a lot of consulting with your allies, uh, with business, uh, with the U.S. Congress in the case of the United States or with parliaments around the world, uh, with interested parties, all the stakeholders. Uh, and um, although I supported, for instance, President Trump meeting with Kim Jong-un, he's done so without a strategy, without a plan, without a negotiating team to really move forward. Uh, where Iran is concerned, uh, you won't be shocked to hear that I did wished he had not, the president had not withdrawn from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. I think it's very predictable as a result that we are where we are today at an incredibly dangerous moment. Uh, I hope the president is talking with our allies and partners. Uh, I think there are a lot of people this morning, and then I'll stop in a second so my colleagues can talk, we don't have a lot of time. Um, I know a lot of people want Saudi Arabia to take care of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, and no American facilities, no American personnel were killed, and I certainly don't want to go to war over an attack on an oil uh, facility. Nonetheless, constant attacks on oil facilities will roil the world economy, and it will affect the United States as well as countries around the world. Uh, so we need to be part of that discussion with the Saudis about what they're going to do. And the other reason we have to be part of that discussion is there are 70,000 American troops between Egypt and Pakistan under U.S. Central Command. We have a lot of troops in Iraq. We have people in Syria, we have people in Yemen, a horrible, horrible war that should be ended by the Saudis. Uh, and so we want to make sure that if Saudi Arabia is going to take some action, that uh, our troops uh, won't end up dead. Speaking of marshalling the strategic advantage of the United States, the United States has 55 formal allies. Russia has five, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Armenia. China only has one, uh, North Korea. Uh, our allies make up six of the 10 biggest economies, six of the 10 biggest militaries. However, if you look at who is ascendant in foreign policy domestically for the United States, whoever has had less experience has tended to win presidential elections. And even the successful Democratic 
candidates have been insurgents, Jimmy Carter, uh, Bill Clinton, and also Barack Obama. What can our foreign policy establishment do to encourage engagement in global affairs? Well, first, uh, I think uh, thanks so much for all of you to come to Chicago, and it's great to come to this great town, and, and uh, we, we got some great weather, too, for you, yeah. uh, which helps. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here on the stage uh, with, uh, with so many good friends. Uh, Wendy and I were deep in the trenches uh, trying to deal with allies, who, by the way, are a pain in the neck. Uh, they, they, you know, they have views. <laughs> <It's> uh, <interesting. laughs> they, don't have, they don't always do what we want them to do. You know, you go out there and say, go do this, and then they don't, and it's really a pain. Uh, 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 and, you know, that's what I did for four years, telling allies to do and then saying, no, nah, we're not going to do that. Uh, and, uh, but sometimes they do. Uh, and, and, and so thinking about how to engage in the world, uh, I think it was, again, Winston Churchill who said, uh, working with allies is the worst thing you can do except for all the other things. He says that of a lot of things, including democracy, but it's true. Uh, they are a pain, but just consider what it means if you don't work with them, if you don't have them alongside uh, with you. Um, you know, Donald Trump uh, canceled a pending meeting with the Taliban at Camp David, which is a dumb thing to do in the first place, because an American soldier was killed. Well, alongside that American soldier, a Romanian soldier was killed. Nobody talks about that. But the per capita number of deaths of Dutch, Estonian, and Canadians in Afghanistan helping us to deal with our war when we were attacked is higher than it is for Americans. So they're putting a lot on the line for us. And the good news is that American people appear to understand the importance of alliances. We've just released a poll at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs asking Americans what they think about American engagement. What, does, what makes America safe? <clears throat> How should we play an active role in world affairs? And, and whether we should play an active role in world affairs. And we are at a near high point in, 40, in the last 45 years that we've been on polling of Americans wanting to take an active part in world affairs. And when you ask them what does that mean and how do we become safe, allies are at the top of the list. They think, they, Americans, we think that alliances are critical to our security. Support for NATO today is higher than it has been in the last 45 years. That's a remarkable finding. And that suggests that this idea of beating up on allies, of telling them uh, that they are worthless, that they just need to do more so we can do less, isn't playing very well in the American public. Here's an interesting statistic. 78%, the highest number ever in 45 years, of Americans either want to maintain or increase our commitment to NATO. I don't hear Donald Trump making that argument. Maybe that's why Americans are now finally uh, uh, realizing that that's what they want to do. So allies are really critical. They're critical to every strategy we want to do. We couldn't have gotten the Iran agreement, despite your credible negotiating skills, but for the fact that our allies were part and parcel of that agreement. Uh, we're not going to get China to change the way it does business unless allies work with us to figure out how to pr put pressure on, on the Chinese. We're not going to be able to deter or defend or protect ourselves against Russia unless we do it together with allies. Frankly, there's nothing we can do in the world unless we do it with our allies. And the, 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 the worst thing we can do is to alienate them, to push them aside, to put them into uh, the, uh, the basket, not of allies, but of adversaries, because that's the consequence if you don't treat them like human beings who have views pain in the neck they can be. Mm -hmm. Clyde, my favorite moment in the last couple of years abroad has been after a shashlik meal that we had in the Republic of Tatarstan, watching you going through the grocery stores and looking at the positioning of Coca-Cola <laughs> bottles. Uh, you've had some intense negotiations with Pakistan, with Myanmar, opening up businesses in Eastern Europe. You've been in Ramallah. Can you talk to us about commercial diplomacy and the role that non-state actors can have in advancing uh, vision overseas. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Sam, for having us here. It's great to be here with these colleagues who, uh, over the years, we have been practicing the art of commercial diplomacy, and it's wonderful to have a, a great audience here. Um, I spent 30 years at Coca-Cola. Many of those years, Wendy is a good example, with partners uh, in government. 
And Coca-Cola operates, I, I get asked the question, what did you do over the last 30 years? And I said, what I really did was I wandered the world as an ambassador, as much for the United States uh, as for the brand itself. And when asked sort of what's the magic, what's the secret to how Coca-Cola has built this extraordinary business? Imagine 207 countries. We're, we operate in every country in the world except uh, North Korea and Cuba, and you have no trouble getting a Coke in either of those places. <laughs> um, but but the, the art, really the secret, as it were, to the brand and how we build the brand was that everywhere we went, we went understanding that we were a guest in that country and understanding that our role was to help build sustainable communities in each of those countries and to be a participant in economic growth, political stability, social well-being, all of it. We always said we showed up, we unpacked our bags, and we threw them away. And it, it's interesting because I, I look at, over the years, our partnering both with our sovereign government, the United States, but also with the local governments where we, where we operated to try to find solutions and to find common ground, to try to improve things. And, and that to me is really the essence of what diplomacy is all about. Um, I, I worry today, and I was at a dinner, I was telling Wendy with uh, her former boss and one of my mentors, Madeleine Albright, earlier this week, and we were talking about the fracturing of the relationship between business and commerce and government. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it, it, you can't in a really affect change unless there is this partnership. You were talking about allies. I mean, from my perspective, there is no more important ally that government can have than business, and particularly the multinationals and particularly the <coughs> American companies who are out there trying to take the governance, gold standards, a whole host of things that we think can lift economies, communities, and individuals. So, you know, this is a very natural sort of space that we are in, uh, the intersection of commercial and public and di diplomatic and, and political. As we hyperventilate with the headlines today, what's the question that we are not asking that we should be asking? And is there something additional that should be keeping us up at night? I, I think the thing that is most concerning is what the future of work is going to look like. One of the reasons that Donald Trump was elected and quite frankly Brexit happened and uh, autocrats are elected in many countries around the world, though there's some pushback to that now, which I'm very glad to see, is because people feel incredibly uncertain all over the world. They feel uncertain about what the future is going to be like. What is artificial intelligence going to mean they're not going to have a job anymore? Will climate change mean that their house will disappear? Uh, that the place where they live will be underwater? Uh, what, what will that future be like? What's it going to be like for their kids or their grandkids in my case? And they're also sort of thrown off by rapid social change. Um, because we have mobility, because we have social media, because we are connected, because everybody can get a Coca-Cola wherever they live in the world, uh, we're not sure what's going to happen. We all, I certainly am very glad in the United States that people can marry whom they love, but for a lot of people that happened very fast and they don't know where they stand anymore, just like they don't know where they stand that their wives who once stayed at home now go to work. So the world has changed very, very rapidly. It makes people incredibly anxious. And when people are incredibly anxious, they look for certainty. And certainly often comes uh, with an autocrat. Uh, that was the rise of Hitler in Nazi Germany, Germany who was elected. Uh, Madeleine Albright wrote uh, her famous book on fascism. Uh, and Mussolini and Hitler were both elected by people who were concerned and became nationalistic and looked for certainty. So I don't think there is a government in the world that's doing sufficient planning, either for the changes in climate, certainly our government isn't, uh, we're relying on the private sector to do the job, quite frankly, and mayors and governors, uh, and we aren't, no government is really focused on the future of work and how that's gonna change and where people are gonna get their dignity from. For me, that's the crucible of the future. 
let me build on that because I, I, I completely agree with Wendy and it leads me to this question. What does successful democratic leadership look like? Mm. Because I know what unsuccessful democratic leadership looked like. It's what we had in the 1930s. It's demagoguery in one form or another, which is winning uh, in, uh, in our societies. It won in, in the UK, uh, it, it's win it won here, it's winning in most of uh, places in, in, in Europe where the demagogue is able to mo mobilize masses in a way that we haven't really seen since the 19, 1930s when the circumstances were equally uncertain for people on the day-to-day living when their economic livelihood was at stake, when their identity in the post-World War I Europe uh, was very much at stake uh, and trying to figure out how they could, how they could survive. So how, how can you be a successful democratic, and let me underscore democratic, because I know how to be a successful non-democratic leader, uh, that's, uh, that's the easier part. But how do you defeat demagoguery? Mm. How do you marshal uh, enough political and public support when the public is so uncertain about its future, trying to figure out how to be able to, uh, to survive day to day, how to make sure that their kids are off at least as well as they were uh, when they were growing up, if not better. How do you marshal the right kind of leadership? Frankly, I, we haven't seen it yet. Uh, we haven't seen it in Europe. Uh, we haven't seen it in the United States. It's a devilishly d difficult problem. Uh, in part because politics tends to polarize, demagoguery polarizes on both sides, and trying to bridge those, those gaps is very, very difficult. But that's the challenge for individuals. It's for leaders to step up, to figure out how they can resonate with a sufficient number of people so they can win elections and then govern in a way that secures their ultimate success as politicians as, and, and more importantly as leaders uh, of a country. And part, I think part of the answer actually lies not in the traditional sphere, but in the non-traditional sphere. If you look at the great leaders, it seems to me now in, in, in our political environment, they're no longer just or even uh, at all national leaders. They're city leaders, they're mayors, they're corporate leaders. Or 16-year-olds. Uh, 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 or 16-year-olds or, or in one form or another. Or 18-year-olds, the kids from Parkland. Absolutely. Uh, or, uh, or Greta from Sweden on, on climate change. They are trying to figure out how to, to mobilize communities in a different way than we have traditionally done, which is about how can I buy your vote uh, with uh, the easiest uh, way to get stuff done. I mean, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Paul Pullman, former yeah. head of Unilever, who, who had a vision of what a company needs to do to be able to be successful by, not at the same time, by improving sustainability in the operations of the company. And, that, and it's that kind of leadership, hugely successful, uh, that we need uh, in, at, at the national level. Uh, if you look at really successful mayors, Michael Bloomberg uh, was a very, very successful mayor for New York. What can we learn from that, those kinds of leaders today that gets us uh, to the future uh, in a way that, that leads to successful and democratic leadership? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this point about leadership and the crisis of leadership is, 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 is really at the core of, you asked the question, what keeps me awake at night, other than my children's Instagram account. Um, yeah, and, and it's, a, it's the collective conscience, you know, whether it's the collective conscience of this country or the communities we live in or really the world, and, you know, the, the democracy, this, this incredible, fantastic democracy that we have built, was built over time around this collective conscience. And it, it was tested over time. There's no question about it. And um, I remember I, I had a boss, uh, Roberto Guzueta, uh, the former chairman, late chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola, and he always said, there's no such thing as an ethical company. There are only ethical or unethical people. Mm -hmm. And to the extent to which the people who populate and define and run anything either represent you know, those ethics and the values and so forth, um, that's really what defines who, who we are. And I, um, you know, I, my, my background was originally in theology and ecclesiastical history. Who knows how I got into soft drink sales? <laughs> but I have always been curious about the intersection of faith 
and commerce and politics. And, and what really then defines what, what we believe in, the values that sort of drive us and motivate us, um, and then that that creates a collective conscience. And uh, it's being tested once again. And I think uh, for me, it, it keeps me awake that are we all asking the questions that we should be asking of ourselves and of our communities and our leaders and the greater sort of uh, entity, um, what is the right thing to do? So, I want to focus on your role as educators, if I can, and reconceptualizing the word education and, and for vision. So, educare or educare, one means to train or to mold, that's how we normally think of education. The other one means to lead out or to lead forth. And so one of my arguments about education, particularly global education, is you have to train yourself to actually get outside of yourself. Clyde, you serve on advisory boards at Harvard and the Russian Presidential Academy. You're the most popular uh, professor, guest professor at Georgetown. The work that you're doing, Ambassador, and the council, uh, at your doctoral training at MIT. Ambassador Sherman now running the most important uh, leadership center at the most important <laughs> policy school. What is the prescription for educating a new generation of people who can peer into the future. Mm. Why don't we go the other way? Go for <laughs> wow, it. Wow, okay. <laughs> Give you a few minutes then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we know each other really well. Um, look, I, I think uh, it's this question around intellectual curiosity. Um, how are we stimulating curiosity in the context of education? And you and I also have had this conversation. Does the model still do that? Um, we are operating with a model that is now 100 years old, at least the higher education model. But you could say the same thing about you know, high school and elementary school. And we've just, it's like a Christmas tree. We've just put more and more ornaments on it. And it's gotten bigger and bigger and heavier and more expensive. And I think, the, uh, are we challenging that model? And the ability of that model to create the, the curiosity in the people who we are educating, or are they just going through the motions? So um, I think the, the, the question I have, I don't have the answer, is are, are, we, are we challenging that model in the appropriate way? So I think, and let me build on that model because I think that's, that's actually key. We think of education as something you do from four till mm. 22. We really need to think about education as something you do from birth to death, as something that the world is changing so rapidly that things are moving in such, uh, at such speed and complexity that the idea that what you learn from four to 22 is relevant when you're 59, in my case, is laughable. In the last 30 years, more has changed than in the previous 3,000 years. And the idea that somehow our education system prepares people to take on what is going to go on uh, uh, in and of itself, it just doesn't make any sense. Yes, to get the, the tools and the skills that are necessary to know how to learn is part of it. But actually thinking about education as a lifelong pursuit that is inherent in every aspect of our lives in how we deal with our families, in our social groups, in our civic societies, and of course at our jobs, is absolutely critical. It's the only way we, we're going to succeed. Uh, we know we're massively failing on our education system, massively. We are, particularly our uh, elementary and secondary education in this country in particular, is terrible. It is not competitive with the rest of the world. But we're also massively failing in thinking about how to educate once we leave high school or university and what it is that we do afterwards. We're massively failing as a society, as companies, as civic institutions for really not thinking through how everything we do and every job we have needs to have an educational component in order to succeed. And then what does that education mean? One is curiosity. The other one is impact. People want to be able to figure out what they do have an impact. Impact either on the, on the bottom line, a social impact, an ethical impact. And this, particularly this younger generation, is no longer satisfied by sitting in the classroom and being told what is important. 
Uh, they want to be part and parcel of the discovery and then of the implementation and of the impact of it. Uh, and that is what is what's kind of changing very ra as well in the way new generations are moving forward. It's a huge problem. The, the, the work problem becomes part of it. Uh, but we haven't even started to scratch the surface, it seems to me. By the way, if you look at the presidential campaign, we're not talking about education at all. No one is. Uh, and and it, it tells you, we're talking about teacher salaries, which is important, but that's not education. That's how to get educators to be part of the process. But education as a vocation, as a way to think about life, is not part of what we're doing today. So I wanted to be last because I wanted to give you all some optimism <laughs> since all we talk about most of the time, all of us are how terrified we are of what's going on in the world. I certainly do every day. Uh, but uh, I was in Washington very happily doing uh, consulting business with Albright Stonebridge Group and had worked with Clyde, for instance, for years and uh, running around about my book, not for the faint of heart, and doing consulting and having a good time. Uh, and I got a call, what I consider coming to be the director of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, David Gergen had been uh, the director for 18 years and they were looking for a successor. And I thought about, my husband and I thought about it, helped that we had a daughter and two little grandsons in Boston. Uh, but uh, I decided to do it, we decided to do it, because there is no greater challenge than having principled effective public leadership in the future. And my optimism is I just spent last weekend with 125 of our fellows, 125 students for whom wonderful donors have provided scholarship support. Half of these students were from around the world. Uh, the Kennedy School has an enormous mixture of both Americans and folks from all over the world. Um, 25 of them were either active duty military or veterans. It was an incredibly diverse group. These young, and the whole theme of the weekend was leading with humility, and servant leadership, that when you are a leader, you're not in it for yourself, you're not in it to line your pocket, you're in it to be of service, to have sort of a mental framework, whether you want to be a social entrepreneur, you want to be a government official as I was and as Evo was, you want to be a business person, what is the ethical basis on which you do it and who are you trying to serve? These young people were just spectacular, they have all done unbelievable entrepreneurial things already. I was intimidated as hell. I could never have competed with them at their age. They're just amazing. And whether it is Greta Thunberg, uh, the 16-year-old who is leading the climate movement, or it is the Parkland kids, or the kids in Chicago who joined with the Parkland kids, who have to face violence every single day, who moved uh, to try to get um, uh, gun safety in our country, not to take away people's guns, but to have common sense gun safety. So I am very optimistic about these young people, but I quite agree with Clyde about the need for curiosity. I completely agree with Evo about what we have to do with our school system, because all of you are working somewhere, and you know that in-service learning development um, of your career, of your curiosity, of your leadership style is very critical to success. And the last thing I would say is that we encourage these young people to take risks. Uh, when kids get to Harvard, it's usually because they've done everything right <laughs> to get there. And they're not great risk takers, even though some of these folks have done tremendously entrepreneurial things. Life is not for the faint of heart. It does require taking educated, thoughtful risks for sure, but to take on the challenges we've all been talking about this morning, if you sit still, we're never going to master what we need to to help our kids get to the future. I can't follow those words. It's been a pleasure to eavesdrop on this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Sam. One, one quick note before you leave the stage. Uh, I think you got a sense from Wendy Sherman that there's toughness in there. So I loved it near the end when she said, I want to be optimistic. <laughs> yeah. I got to say to do what they do at the intersection of worlds, politically, commercially, and they all are, have been in these spaces for their careers is really, really hard. So there has to be some level of optimism, but there's something else going on here and that's caring. And I, and I mean real caring. 
yeah, we need to make money, we need to achieve our objectives, and we need to figure out the policy. We need to train future global leaders around the world. Um, but you do that also because you truly care to make a positive difference. Absolutely. And I thank all of you for being here. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you.